And so Paul illustrates that with this long series of descriptors about all these unified elements, these elements of unity, or aspects, I should say, of unity in the church. So I just want to walk through them and kind of identify them one at a time. Sorry, no pun intended. And, and just, although that's kind of intended once I thought about it, just walking through each one of them because it's, you know, people will say sometimes, oh yeah, of course the church has to have unity. But what does that mean? What do you mean specifically when you say unity? What kind of unity are we talking about here? Be specific. So here are the specific aspects of unity that Paul describes. So when he, he, in verse 3, he says, we're going to be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit. The Greek word there for unity is henotes. It literally means oneness, okay? It's from the Greek number for one. So henotes is oneness. So there's a oneness to the church. All right, what are the aspects of that oneness? All right, so the first one is important. I'm going to walk through these. Is visible unity. Visible unity. You see this when he, in verse 4 when he says there is one body. So crucial. There's no such thing as an invisible body. I mean, there might be in the movies or something like that. But as a rule, bodies are visible. So when he describes the church as having one body, as Christ is having one body, that's its visible unity. There must be visible unity for the church to be the true church. Second, there, also can, there is also invisible unity. That's implied by his language of one spirit, right? So a lot of people, especially a lot of non-Catholic Christians, err. They'll say, oh yeah, I believe the church is one, but they're talking about the invisible spiritual unity between Christians, right? We all have the same spirit, right? We have faith. But Paul, it's not either or, it's both and. It's not just invisible spiritual unity. It's also visible bodily unity. Right. So, invisible unity, visible unity. Third, there's also eschatological unity. Remember, eschatology talks about the future hope? Well, he says there is one hope. We all hope for the same thing, for the same end. The resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. We say it in the creed. That's our, our one hope. We share that hope. As a Christian, you can't say, well, you know, I'm not so sure about the resurrection of the body. I think maybe some of us will be angels and then others of us might be like pure spirits that just dwell in some other realm. Or, no, 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 no. There's one hope, right? The resurrection of the dead and life of the world to come. That's our hope. So we have one eschatology. Fourth, a Christological unity. We have one Lord. There are not many different Jesuses running around. Your Jesus, my Jesus, his Jesus, her Jesus, you know, this Christ, that Christ. No, no, no. It's one Lord. And whenever Paul says Lord, the vast majority of the time, he uses the word kurios, Lord, to refer to Christ. Okay? So there's one, one Lord, one Christ. So they have one Christology. There's also, this is important, doctrinal unity, right? And here he uses the term pistis in its way that refers to certain truths of faith to which we give assent. One faith. We believe the same things. You'll see this expressed in the early church quickly as heresies rose. The, the rule of faith, is what it was called, was the profession of the creed. In its early form, the Apostles' Creed, but then eventually as it developed, you get the Nicene Creed and then the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed, which becomes the kind of final definitive form of the creed that we profess to this day in Sunday Masses. So the creed is a summary of the essential elements of the one faith, the one apostolic faith that we all confess together. Right? It's not your faith, my faith. There are su there's a subject element to faith. That's not what Paul's talking about here. He's talking about the unified element, the doctrinal element of the faith, the mysteries of the faith to which we all, in which we all believe, in which we participate. All right, so we got visible unity, invisible unity, eschatological unity, Christological unity, doctrinal unity. We also have sacramental unity. Very important. One faith, one Lord, one baptism. So here Paul's talking about the right through which we enter into the one body of Christ. Every Christian has to enter into the body of Christ ordinarily. There are some extraordinary circumstances or exceptions. But the ordinary path is through the waters of baptism. Right? Unless a man is born of water and spirit, he can't see the kingdom of God. That's Jesus, John chapter 3. So sacramental unity is also crucial. Theological unity. We have one God. 
one Lord, one God. There you see the distinction too. Jesus, he's referring to Christ as Lord. He's referring to God, the Father. One God and Father of us all, who is above all and through all and in all. So here we see, notice Paul climaxes his, this is not inconsequential. He climaxes his hymn to unity with the Trinity, right? with God the Father. One God and Father through all and end all. So you have the unity of spirit. right? We have one Lord, Christ, and then one God and Father. So what is the perfect symbol of true unity? It's the inconceivable, inestimable, unfathomable, mysterious union of the one God who is three divine persons, three distinct persons, but they are so united, they, they are in, in fact one true God. The mystery of the Trinity is the perfect example of unity. And so that model of Trinitarian unity is what we seek to actualize in our lives in the church through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's only the Holy Spirit who can bring about that kind of unity. Right? And Paul knows that, and that's why he begins with the Spirit and ends with the Father. Try to imagine a church where you've got visible unity, one body, you can see the church. Right? Everybody, it's clear, this is the church. You got invisible unity, that's a spiritual bond. You got eschatological unity, doctrinal unity, Christological unity, sacramental unity, theological unity, ultimately all within the Trinitarian framework. That is the biblical description of the church. That's what the, no, that's not just biblical, that's the Pauline description of the church, right? It's not individuals setting up their own churches, their own sects, their own divisions, sending themselves, giving themselves apostolic authority, may, uh, you know, a uh, lack of clarity about who's the head, who are the members. No, 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 no. That's not the church of the apostles. The church of the apostles is one. It's holy. The Holy Spirit is the unifier, right? It's Catholic. It's universal. Um, and it's apostolic. It's, and you can't see this in this verse, but if you have any doubts, you just back up to um, Ephesians chapter 2, the same letter. Um, after talking about us having access to one spirit and the Father, he actually says in chapter 2, verse 19, you are no longer strangers and sojourners. You are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built into it for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. So notice the imagery there. The temple of God, the church, is built upon what? The foundations of the apostles. So it's an apostolic church as well. So I bring all this up because in our day, there's just, especially with the proliferation of so many different Christian denominations, and so many different sects. It can be very confusing, right? It can seem actually almost unbelievable when the church, when we profess in the creed, I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Right? How can we say there's one church? It's even more difficult when you see divisions within the church, right? People infighting and that kind of thing. And that's been around since the beginning, right? It is a stumbling block to the belief in the unity. Paul himself is actually addressing it. He's trying to call the Ephesians to not have that kind of infighting, but it doesn't make him deny the oneness of the church. And so, in closing, I'd just like to interpret these verses in light of what the church says and, and invite you to really reflect on the unity of the church, especially in light of the teaching of the church. So, I, I want to look here at the Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraphs 814 to 816. It's an excellent section on the unity of the church. 